From a studio high above the clouds of the Okanagan Valley, this is the Cannabis Podcast. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. Now, here's your host and bud tender, Gary Johnston. Once more, here we are for another episode of the Cannabis Podcast. Welcome back. If this is the first time for you to join the ride, well, I hope you're going to enjoy yourself. We got a bunch of things cannabis to talk about today, which shouldn't be a surprise to anyone. And let me get my list of what we're going to talk about today and we can make it even easier. Cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome, CHS. It's something that got raised uh, actually probably a couple of months ago by Dana, a listener who suggested because her boyfriend suffers from it, that it would be a worthy topic of discussion. And I had promised to do that. Today is the day. Plus, we have an interview with Jeff and Sherry Aubin. They are the owners of Smoker Farms, and we're going to hear all about their passion for cannabis in just a little bit. On Cultivar Corner, it's Dunn Cannabis Acai Berry Gelato. And as terpenes become more and more important for consumers, we're going to finish up by re-examining the basic terps that give cannabis its flavor, smell, and many would argue its effects. All of that and more is coming up on Episode 71 of the Cannabis Podcast. And allow me to start off with some shameless promotion. Uh, I'm always excited when I get recognition of some form at the Cannabis Podcast. It's just cool that you're listening and, and that you're enjoying the experience. The folks at CBDevious.com, never heard of them before until I got an email in my inbox from them this week. They have collected data from a number of different sources, and the sources include the folks at... I want to be specific here. Listen Notes, Crunchbase, Sembrush, and Refs. Now, I've taken a look at Listen Notes. I haven't dove into the others yet, but I intend to. And these are sources that are accumulating all kinds of information on podcasts all around the world. And why I'm excited is they came up with their list of the best 20 cannabis podcasts for 2021. And in fact, we made two of the lists, the best cannabis Canada podcasts of 2021 and the best cannabis podcast of 2021. The cannabis podcast proudly sits on both of those lists and congrats to all the other podcasts that are on there too. give you an opportunity to check out some other cool podcasts. But I have to say it's pretty fun. I got quite a chuckle out of seeing the results on that. And now you can as well. And I posted those below so you can check those articles out yourself. Cannabis hyperemesis syndrome, CHS. It's a condition that leads to repeated and severe bouts of vomiting. Now it's rare and it only occurs in daily long-term users of marijuana. Anybody listening to this podcast who might be a bit concerned at this moment? Marijuana has several active substances. These include THC and related chemicals. These substances bind to molecules found in the brain, and that causes the drug high and other effects that users feel. Your digestive tract also has a number of molecules that bind to THC and related substances. So marijuana also affects the digestive tract. For example, the drug can change the time it takes the stomach to empty. It also affects the esophageal sphincter. That's the tight band of muscle that opens and closes to let food from the esophagus into the stomach. Long-term marijuana use can change the way the affected molecules respond and lead to the symptoms of CHS. Marijuana is the most widely used illegal drug in the U.S. Young adults are the most frequent users, and a small number of these people develop CHS. It often only happens in people who have regularly used marijuana for several years. Often, CHS affects those who use the drug at least once a day. What causes it? Marijuana has very complex effects on the body. Experts are still trying to learn exactly how it causes CHS in some people. In the brain, marijuana often has the opposite effect of CHS. It helps prevent nausea and vomiting. The drug is also good at stopping such symptoms in people having chemotherapy. But in the digestive tract, marijuana seems to have the opposite effect. It actually makes you more likely to have nausea and vomiting. With the first use of marijuana, the signals from the brain may be more important. That may lead to anti-nausea effects at first. 
But with repeated use of marijuana, certain receptors in the brain may stop responding to the drug in the same way. That may cause repeated bouts of vomiting found in people with CHS. It still isn't clear why some heavy marijuana users get the syndrome, but others don't. What are the symptoms? People with CHS suffer from repeated bouts of vomiting. In between these episodes are times without any symptoms. Now, there's a whole lot more detail involved in this story, but mm, (laughs) I'm thinking it doesn't make really good audio to talk a whole bunch about vomiting and belly symptoms and all that. So I hope you understand that I'm going to call it there and leave the article there for you to dive into and get all the details for yourself. We've at least raised the idea, but I don't want to spend much more time talking about the specifics that happens to a very small percentage. And can we all take a moment to be thankful that this happens to a very small percentage of people? And if you are one of those affected, I'm sorry. I, I, it must be absolutely horrible. But apparently, stopping smoking cannabis makes the symptoms better. Cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome. Now you know. A few weeks ago, I had a lovely meeting with a couple that came into the store to tell me about their plants. The plants were to grow some craft cannabis and have it available for sale in the legal market. Their names were Jeff and Sherry Aubin. Delightful couple, had a great story to tell. Jeff has been a grower or was a grower in the illicit market for years and years. Sherry brings many years of administrative experience to be the backbone of the company. And together, they have created Smoker Farms. I had the opportunity to have a conversation with Jeff and Sherry. And it was an interesting experience because they are located in a a tiny community in BC's interior, in the Kootenays, Carmi. And we discovered, or at least I discovered, that the internet there is kind of slow. And there was a bit of a pause in the conversation. Now, fortunately for you, (laughs) I have done all of the magic and made the conversation seem seamless in terms of that delay. But there literally was almost a two, two and a half second delay uh, for many of the responses as we were having this interview. We pick up the conversation with Jeff and Sherry Aubin just after I have welcomed them to the Cannabis Podcast. Hello. Hello. Thank you, Gary. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. It's my pleasure. So why don't we, why don't we start with, why don't you let everybody know uh, where exactly you are in BC and where would we find Smoker Farms? All righty. We are located in the beautiful West Kootenays, boundary country. Um, we Everybody says Beaverdale, but we're really in Carmi, British Columbia. Um, we're right near the banks of the Kettle River, idyllic mountain area here. It's beautiful. All our wells are spring fed, basically. It's, uh, it's a beautiful place to, to live. We live here full time now. We've, uh, we've sold all of our... Uh, Places or our place in Kelowna, we've sold it last year to be a part, to be a part of this more full time because uh, in growing cannabis, uh, you, you need to be hands on full time. So that's an introduction to uh, where we are. And uh, perfect. So so then let, let's talk about how you got here. So before we talk about about what Smoker Farms is, Jeff, why, why don't you give me a sense of what your cannabis heritage is? Where where have you been, and, and how did you get here? Well, my cannabis heritage starts many, many years ago. I've been involved in the in the cannabis industry for 25 plus years. Um, a buddy of mine years and years ago kind of showed me the growing of cannabis and what it was like, and uh, and I and I and I took it on and uh, made it part of my life. Um, I love the cannabis plant. Um, I'm an avid smoker. But, you know, there's something to be said about walking into a flowering room of cannabis. It's overwhelming. The smell, the look, just everything about it, man. I I love cannabis. I'm 100% into cannabis. Everything about (laughs) it makes me excited. It really does. 
A man after my heart, Jeff. I I, I love hearing because uh, I, I you know I'm the same way. Yes, and, and I love hearing the passion in somebody's voice when 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 we when we talk about this wonderful little plant. Oh, absolutely. So you have you have a significant heritage as a grower, then? Yes, I have. Uh, I have many years of experience. I've I've basically grown every single way there is possible: dirt, beds. I've pretty much tried everything over the last 25 years, and. Uh, and and now I've become I've I've kind of crafted my art of what I do. Even though in this new project we started with Smoker Farms, I've I've changed everything about the way I used to do things. But there's still things that are critical to growing cannabis that are important. Knowing what to do, when to do, how to do, and all and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, I'm I'm an old school legacy guy. There's no doubt about it. Man. Okay, cool. So then what was it that sparked the change? What what made you decide to move from that illicit market prior to legalization and now find your spot in the legal world? Well, the problem with the illicit market, it was getting it was getting very bad. Um there wasn't there, there wasn't any basically to continue in the illegal market was challenging. Um not not even just to the legal point, but the prices of product, it wasn't worth it. The expectations you were supposed to do to get some kind of a product out to get a to get paid for it. it it was unrealistic at some point where i went you know what i can't continue this way so either i'm going to get a full-time job or i'm going to go down this arduous path of hell and mayhem to try to be a legal cannabis grower <laughs> and i say that loosely but it's true I think you you intimated a, a, a few of these stories along the way there in that response. Uh, <laughs> shall we say there has been some obstacles along the way? There's been a lot of <laughs> obstacles along the way. Um, you, you know, knowing knowing what we know now versus two and a half years ago when we started, uh, I sure I'm glad I didn't know what it was, how tough it was going to be, because I would have not done this to ourselves, but. Now knowing where we are and what we've created, it seems like it will be rewarding for us. So, nice. Thankfully, we didn't know what we were getting into that much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sometimes ignorance is bliss, isn't it? We call it the roller coaster. We've been on it for quite some time now. <laughs> I'm sure you and have. The, but the illegal black market roller coaster versus the legal roller coaster. You know what? There's a lot of things that are kind of the same. It's, I'm sure there it's, are. It's, it's kind of strange. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't surprise me at all that, that you would say that because there there are a lot of similarities as, as we go. Okay, so so you made the switch. You started Smoker Farms. Give us a sense of, of, of what you're bringing to us with the introduction of Smoker Farms. You made some mention that you've kind of changed some of your behaviors and, and, and what you do. So tell us the story. I've changed a lot of what I what I used to do. Um, when we first got Smoker Farms going, we we paired up with uh, with another LP uh, out of Calgary. They helped us out with some strains. They actually, it, they we we went to their facility last year. We looked at it. I was blown away by the way cannabis was being grown. So I adopted all their policies of what they're doing and how they're growing cannabis. Uh, their master head grower at the time. Uh, Danny says he is a master of, of cannabis. This guy knows everything about cannabis, man. But this guy taught taught me how to use dosatron units, uh, rockwool blocks, on how to grow some of the most science based, beautiful cannabis on the planet. Nice. So basically, what I did is I took what he taught me and learned. I put it in the facility. I had some other people come tell me that my my product just didn't look as crafty as it should, so I've refined my whole drying, curing method. Okay. A totally different proprietary system on how to do it now, and we're basically making little works of art. Every flower is like a work of art. And I, and I want people, when, when they do try our product, I want them to open up that little magic tin, and I want them to look at it like it's a work of art in this, in this tin. And yeah. with what I've learned from some of the people that have influenced me over the last year that's what we're able to provide to people now is just a magical little flower there that is it's completely beautiful man and it's delicious to smoke as well yeah <laughs> yeah that's a very good description uh, it, it is a, a wondrous little plant as as those flowers develop can you tell us anything about the uh, the cultivars that you're growing the cultivars that i'm growing right now i've i'm growing the ultimate which is a high terp 
uh, 20 to 23 percent strain. Ooh. It's a beautiful indica product. Nice. It's, uh, mixed with um, wedding cake. That's kind of all the genetics I know about it um, from from the LP that I got it from. So that that was kind of my start into the the legal industry here. But I have I have Master Kush Ultra, which is I know there's Master Kush Ultra on the open market right now. Right. Um, there's a couple different varieties that have been out there. They're not they're not near the THC of mine. I've had mine tested uh, a year or so ago, not under the greatest conditions, but it tested at 24. 25 percent um but this master kush ultra it's been going for 15 years at least um i know the people that originally started it with seeds it's an amazing beautiful product um it's got such a cult following in parts of the of canada here um so it basically it, it, it is what set me off it is part of the reason why we started smoker farms was because i knew the rest of canada needed to try this this master kush ultra to be blown away like other people that have in the past. And so those are the two cultivars that I'm dealing with right now, but also in my, my seed bank, my vault, Danny say, as I mentioned his name before, he is the master. Right. He's, he's from Spain. Originally, this guy's been all over the world. He goes strain hunting. He's been to third world countries, Africa, Iraq, Iran. He's been to all these places searching for seeds and he's a master seed breeder as well, which I've learned to know. So, with his help, we potentially have some of the best seeds on planet Earth as far as I'm concerned. Oh, good for you. And it's an amazing position to be in. We're looking forward to releasing some of these cultivars eventually, but we're going to rock out smoke, or we're going to rock out, sorry, uh, Master Culture for a little while because yeah. people really need to see this old school genetics. But there's very exciting things going to happen for Smoker Farms in the future. Well, you've whet my appetite for the Master Kush Ultra too. Yeah, I can. Uh, oh, I can't wait till you get to try it. Yeah, I can't wait till I get to try it either. Uh, you, you made it sound absolutely delicious. <laughs> oh, it is. So, where are you now as a, as a company then, Jeff? So you you know so you had the vision of Smoker Farms two and a half years ago. You've you've gone up and down that roller coaster, and I'm sure there's still a few twists and turns that are are still to occur. So, so where are you now? Are we delivering to what markets and what are your future plans? So right now, yes, that's, it's been a long journey. Uh, right now we're, 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 uh, we got, like I said, we got our two cultivars we're dealing with. Um, we've joined with a processor, uh, joint venture craft cannabis incorporated. Oh, good choice. Um, a gentleman named Ben Williams has helped. He's a really great guy, man. He's a go-getter. He's helped propel us, uh, to places we never thought we can get so we're on we're on uh, the stage we're on the stage of obviously british columbia right now he's got us into alberta uh we're working on manitoba we're working on saskatchewan ontario is heavily in our sights as well as parts of eastern canada as well um so this this guy has really worked worked hard to get us known and he recognizes what we've done um, but before we even got our our stuff out to market, we went around to every single store, which is how I met you. Yeah, we went to every single dispensary that we could in Penticton, Vernon, and Kelowna. We put ourselves out there to let people know, hey, this is who we are. This is what we are. We're a husband and wife team, trying to make it, trying to see if we can pull this off. And it was duly noted. Our our sales went through the roof. So the way the way we've structured things now is that we're just going to continue to hopefully go through the roof of sales and slowly make our way across Canada and let everybody really see what legacy BC bud is really all about. Good for you. There's, there's a lot of other growers like you, that JBC is helping bring to the market. There is for sure. And I think it's a very smart move. It, it, it helps everybody to, to see more of this going on. I'm, I'm really happy to hear that, that you've got that arrangement and that it's working well for you. Definitely. It, it helps everybody. And we all know that, that before all this micros were allowed to, to be into the system, it was the multi-million dollar companies that had control of our legal cannabis industry. Yeah. And well, we, we know the product that they put out. <laughs> um, some of it's good. I, I'm not, I don't want to, I don't want to talk, talk bad about anybody's product whatsoever. Yeah, that's a good business strategy. It's, it's, it's good. <laughs> it has to be, but, but I think it's time for the rest of Canada to really see what, what real cannabis can be like craft cannabis, small batch, with lots of love, lots of hands-on maintenance to it. It's just a lot more love, love added to it. And we're doing everything to preserve. When we do our cropping out, we, we try to preserve trike. We do everything to handle 
our stuff as little as possible to get the best product out there to people as well, man. We're so we're we're, we're trying to do our best, but yes, yes. Uh, joint venture craft cannabis. Any cannabis you get from them will probably be great. As I was, is what I'm thinking. Yeah, I, I would agree. We we've had a number of uh, products through them, and we will continue to do so because uh, everybody has been really satisfied. And it, and is yours in the nitrous tuna tins as well? I was just going to mention ours is in the little tuna cans as well. It little blast of nitrogen there. Actually, what I found is that that little bit of nitrogen even adds a tiny bit of moisture to the product, which is fantastic because we all know that a lot of the, the legal stuff, it's kind of bone dry. <laughs> it's, it's lost a, a little bit of its love. You're so gentle in your description. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> There's been some polishing going on here. There's polishing yeah. that's been going I'm, on. I'm sure there is. So, so Sherry, I, I'm interested in, in your story along the way as well. So, so we know that Jeff has a deep background in growing. Give us a sense of your background in cannabis and what got you involved and, and what part do you play at Smoker Farms? Well, I met Jeff quite a few years ago, 25 or 26 years ago, and I've been along for the ride ever uh, since then. <laughs> yes. Like I said, a roller coaster. But um, yes, my background is administration, so I definitely have uh, the knowledge to be doing all the background stuff, the reporting and um, invoicing and all that kind of thing. Right. So yes, he runs the front end and I run the back end. Well, that's the thing with a great partnership. Everybody plays their part, right? Yes. So we we desperately need each other to pull this business thing off because without her, uh, my cannabis will never get to the market. And without me, obviously, there's no cannabis. So yeah. Yeah. we're a great partnership to pull this thing off. We really, really honestly yeah. are. We need each other. Good for you. Good for you. I'm glad to hear that. We need each other and love <laughs> each other. So it's really all Aww. good. <laughs> oh, I was hoping we were going to have a moment like that. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, but yes, because my wife doesn't want to say too much. I led her into the path of cannabis. <laughs> yes. uh, she's never she's, she doesn't really smoke as much as I do, but I led her down the path of cannabis, letting leading her to believe that eventually there'd be light at the end of the tunnel, <laughs> and maybe it'd be legalized one day, and I could really tell the world what I do. You got to understand, being a black market legacy yeah. guy, th th even this interview we're doing. <laughs> I'm saying things I've never oh. said to the public ever in my life. So, <laughs> well, I don't think so, you've said anything terribly dangerous yet. So, <laughs> no, I don't know. I think we have, but I've, I've been I've been vetted by the RCB. I've been everything like that. Everybody knows they know where I've come from and, and stuff. But, but it, for now, to be able to explain who I am, how I am, and what I do, it's such a weight lifted off my shoulders that I can actually tell people, and I'm proud to say it. I'm a cannabis grower, man, and I'm, and I'm very proud. Yeah, and good for you. Well, and I can be proud of telling people what he does. Yeah, I bet you are, and I'm glad to hear that too, Sherry. I, I'm a, I'm a big, uh, I, I do not like the stigma that still exists uh, against this plant and the people who are involved in it. Uh, so much of it still just ticks me off. So good for you for sticking up for yourself. It's, it's still there. The stigma is even there when it comes to oh, health I, Canada. In so many um, ways, it, it, just even getting a getting a bank account for the business which which we need to run the business we're considered high risk because it's cannabis which is it's absurd which is beyond it's, ridiculous it's <laughs> uh, the, the major banks they wanted us they wanted to vet us for ten eleven thousand dollars non-refundable funds <laughs> to get a bank account that's absolutely absurd <laughs> so thankfully some of the smaller credit unions realize yeah. that maybe these people are just entrepreneurs and business people and they maybe don't want to break the law but you know, it's the it's the stigmatism that still mm -hmm. goes. Even even Health Canada, the way we're treated, we, we we have to like when we defoliate a room. I may have 150 pounds of of leaf. I'm I'm expected to shred all this leaf, to denature it, so nobody can ever realize what it is. And I have to weigh this whole thing every too. Every bit. every leaf has to be weighed. Every stalk has to be oh, weighed. Geez. If it has any tiny little leaf of cannabis on it, so so it's 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 kind of ridiculous the standards we're held yeah. to, but. What do, what are we going to do? We don't have a no, choice. No. We, we sign the agreement yeah. and we're going to continue with it, but it makes it very challenging for, for a small mom and pop business like ours to pull it off. It just, you're always in the garden. You're always doing something. I bet it does. But it is the way it is for now. So there's, there's, there's lots of debate out there over the term craft cannabis. Do you consider what you're doing at Smoker Farms to be craft cannabis? Is that the umbrella that you think it fits into? I definitely believe, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, we, we craft our weed here. I tell people we don't grow it, but I definitely believe we fit into the craft market. Um, by, by, by being small batch, 
the way the way we raise the I raise the plants or grow the plants. Sorry, we we defoliate the hell out of the plants to make them perfect for flowering, and then the like I said, the drying of it, the way we dry it, we put so much time into these aspects of it that we definitely think we're craft. When, like I said, when you open up that little magic tin, I want people to see a little work of art. And that's what we've we've attained that at this point. And I, I know it can always be better. You can always be better, but we're, we're pushing we're pushing all the time to be better and better. But there are little works of art in every one of those tins that you'll open up at Smoker Farms. That's our yeah, that's our yeah, hope. I'm, I'm really looking forward to. It. And we we touch. I, I was telling the wife earlier that me and her we touch almost every single flower that comes out of our facility. Every single thing has to be looked at. Has to make sure it's right. Make sure there's no problems with it. So we're really hands on. So. If all those components make craft, craft, which I think they do, I think we're definitely uh, yeah, craft. And, and, and in fact, that to me is a is a more refined definition of craft that that you are, because before I've heard it before, you know, based on the amount of yield that you're putting out, and 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 to me that's that's not a mark of craft. It's it's to your point, how much hands on are you doing? So really nice to hear. What's been the favorite part of the journey for you so far? Uh, the favorite part of the journey so far is, well, uh, obviously living in this idyllic setting in rural area in Karmai is absolutely beautiful. There's no screaming children. <laughs> there's no chaos in our neighborhood. That's fantastic. But but getting but getting really to, to do something that I know I was born to do, that I yeah. love, I beyond love. So so that's that's probably the biggest thing is is and being my own boss. Nobody can people can tell me what to do. Obviously, Health Canada tells yeah. me what to do. CRA tells me what to do. All these <laughs> places tell me what to do. But at the end of the day, I'm the one that creates Smoker Farms. I'm the one that creates what we're putting yeah. out. Or we, sorry, we are the ones yeah. doing this stuff. And that's very fulfilling in, in so many ways. It, it's yeah, it's hard to even it's hard to even say what all and, of it. Well, it's tough because there have been a lot of uh, peaks and valleys and rewards but sometimes you're just so beaten down you're waiting and waiting for something exciting and then it happens you're like ah oh, who cares okay next <laughs> yeah it feels yeah. a little anticlimactic it's true it's true <laughs> it does it's like oh good we got that okay next so that's part of the roller coaster right <laughs> up and down up and down but yes the final reward of doing stuff for ourselves is is yes the best part the, the best part of doing stuff for ourselves and knowing that we're building a future for ourselves yeah, yeah nice to hear that and we can end up on a warm sunny beach one day possibly <laughs> retired <laughs> but hey, i got a lot of cannabis to rover for that happen. <laughs> and and you don't mean along the kettle river either no it won't be on the kettle river because it gets cold here <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly okay so so here's the opportunity you've been through this last two and a half years you've you've got smoker farms from from inception you have brought it to reality you've got product out on the market you're you're going to spread your market across the country now you have an opportunity to say here's how this industry should have done a couple of things better pick two and give us a sense of where the legalization that we have today could be a little bit better probably better organization through health canada unfortunately i know they're learning along with us but it i find it challenging particularly the reporting and finding the answers they do respond to emails but it's asking the right questions and getting the right answers to put you in that direction it's i bet it's yeah rather obscure yeah i've, I've heard the description of uh, the our cannabis legislation as as the we built a plane and it's now in the air and now we're trying to figure out how it works and i think that's a pretty accurate yeah. description absolutely I, i've been saying that about smoker farms for a year now that We've built this plane. We're flying it. We still don't have all the pieces put together, and we're trying to figure out how to figure out where get this plane's going to go. Get the wings on, put the seats in, the seat belts, and everything. <laughs> no, it's 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 very complicated. But as my wife says, yeah, it's, it, transparency with with uh, Health Canada would have been better. The, the biggest thing for us was so we we invested all this money in, into Smoker Farms, uh, building my shop, everything like that. It's it's a serious investment that you have to put in, but we didn't know if we were even going to get a cannabis license till the very, very end. So we've invested all our money. Our shop was completely built. And then we find out if we're qualified to actually wow. grow cannabis or not. So thankfully we were. But if we weren't, then what do we do? We have a giant, beautiful building that we can't grow cannabis in. We would have, we would have lost everything and sold it for 10 cents on the dollar to somebody to take over. So it's so it's it's really scary. It, it's scary, man. And, and, and for me... 
these security checks, they should probably, we should probably have been allowed to apply for it first to make sure we even qualify yeah, yeah. To, to go down this path instead of the way they do it. So it's a little bit ass backwards on how, on how they make you do things, which is challenging. And, and, and hopefully in the market, eventually you see the BC LDB has, well, everything goes yeah. through them. So they have, a, they have a, a surcharge that every, every dispensary has to pay, mm-hmm. which makes it really tough because the margins on, on cannabis isn't the greatest for all these shops and they put everything into, into fulfilling their dreams as well of providing cannabis to everybody. So yeah, there is some changes, challenges challenges and changes that could be made, but whether they're going to be made or not, you know, it's, it's, we'll have to see what the future brings, but this is such an evolving industry. It changes daily. This is the review year. You just have to go with the floor. Number three. So there's supposed to be some review in, in October about many of these things. So we'll see if we actually see any, any change in that. A fascinating story you, you both have. I hope Smoker Farms continues to thrive and, and to, to blossom, if I may use that word. Absolutely. And Absolutely. that brings me to my hot seat questions for you. Uh-oh. And oh, feel free to answer them uh, each. Uh, so what's your favorite cultivar? Master Kush Ultra. There's a surprise. I could never <laughs> say anything else but Master Kush Ultra. I've been smoking this for 15 years, man. It is like a hammer to the head sometimes. It is it, have a coach nearby. It is such a fantastic okay, product. Nice. I actually like the ultimate because it's very pretty. Okay. <laughs> I know that sounds silly, but it's every time I'm like, oh, look at this one. Look at this one. Well, the, the ultimate's got such a look to it. It's so purpley oh, okay. and it's not induced by cold or anything. It's just naturally part part pretty. of the cultivar, but it is such a perfectly purpley, crystally bud. It, it does it does win the award for the beautiful oh, nice. bud. I, I okay, will give it that. Excellent. Here. Joints or vape? I use a quant, so it's a type of handheld vape thing. I I got sick of rolling joints so many years ago, and I thought I wanted to live longer by not inhaling all the badness that the cannabis yeah. can have in it. So so I just use my little quant now, and I'm, I'm quite good happy. Good for you. Good for you. And, and Sherry, do you still imbibe? But, but I do have a molecule pipe. A molecule pipe? What's oh, up? Oh, once in a while. It actually... <laughs> I do have a... I brought, I brought out the molecule pipe the other day because I found some old gold stamp... Uh, black seal or gold seal hash from somebody and it's fantastic molecule pipes got little chambers you fill it you put your product in the bowl you fill up all the little round balls until they're all full up and the little vent tube on the end you let it out and you get a blast of 10 chambers worth of beautiful <laughs> ash smoke oh it's fantastic oh, wow <laughs> yes i did uh, indulge in that and was quite done okay i i, I it was a little too potent it, for it sounds like it might be for many people perhaps not myself but <laughs> that's that's another matter <laughs> I'll have when the pandemic's over, Gary. I'll have to stop by and show you my yeah, molecule yeah, pipe, I, and we can I look forward we can to enjoy. It, I look forward to so much to in, in sharing <laughs> cannabis with people once more. Once all of this crazy stuff, I, I oh, in, yeah. in fact, I just had my first shot today. My arm is actually a little sore now. As, as Did I you? Sit here. Yeah, I first my this Great. morning. So it will be for a bit. We had our shot a few weeks ago because we live in the rural yes, community. You guys got a good we're service. quite distance from yeah, a hospital that they that. gave us. Nice. They gave us our shot, which we're. We're thrilled about yeah. absolutely. So, uh, do you have a favorite munchie? Chips, chips. Yeah. <laughs> ketchup <laughs> chips yeah. has to be ketchup dill chips. Pickle. Dill pickle for okay, the way. Excellent. Everybody <laughs> has their flavor. That's the way it works. A uh, flower or edibles? Flower only. We've experimented oh, yeah. a little bit with gummies. Oh. I'm oh. not a cannabis eater. I'm a smoker. <laughs> uh, cannabis and me do not get along when we consume them, <laughs> no, either one of us. No. Okay. okay, well, I'm, I'm with you on that one. The edibles don't do much for me either, so I'm, I'm pleased to hear that. And, yeah. and now we end up with a couple of terminology issues. Uh, and are you both originally from BC, or you, you came here from elsewhere, perhaps? I yeah. was born and raised in Kelowna. I'm from northern Ontario. Okay, so uh, what do you call three and a half grams? Oh, that's an eighth all day long. And Sherry? I don't know. <laughs> She she probably wouldn't know that. You don't know that's an eight. <laughs> <'Cause she's, laughs> I've kept her. I've kept her in Has the she closet. she ever bought cannabis? Because <laughs> sometimes that's the issue too. No, <laughs> never. Okay, well, that, that, that that totally <laughs> explains that. <laughs> I said we're in the black market. It's best that she knew as little as possible. That way, if the police came knocking on the door, she could go. I don't Hello. know what the hell you're talking about. Yeah, I get that. I get that. That that's still, I totally makes sense. And do you have a, a term for a yeah. uh, a running joint when your joint starts burning down the side? It's just 
it's okay. just it's called a run. Yeah, that's okay. we always run. called it old school, just yeah. a run. It's, Canoe is another term that, that's often used, and uh, white rabbit out of Quebec is is another expression that that has popped up in with various people. Oh, really? Okay. Huh. No, we'd we call it, we'd call it a run, and we'd lick our fingers and put our spitty <laughs> saliva on where the thing was to make it Absolutely. stop. You know, old school, old school, like, <laughs> like you need to do pre-pandemic. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it's been a great conversation. I, I enjoyed uh, speaking with both of you. We will leave it there. You enjoy the rest of your night. Thank you very much for having us uh, on your platform, and we hope everybody tries uh, obviously Smoker Farms product. We're yes. very proud of it. Thank you, Gary. THC, CBD, terpene profiles, what's in me? Oh, please explain to me. Go to the corner, go to the corner, oh yeah. Go to the corner, please explain this stuff to me. On Cultivar Corner today, we're looking at another craft grower. This is Dunn Cannabis, and this is their acai berry gelato. So here we go. This is a, a BC product. We Grow BC is the parent company of Dunn Cannabis. And Dunn Cannabis, I'm not sure we featured any of their stuff before, but we're doing so now. This is their acai berry gelato, an indica. And I was intrigued by just, it's, it's very, very nice looking weed. Uh, I took a, a picture of it. It will, in fact, be on the artwork probably for this episode where you get a pretty good picture of what the buds look like. In fact, the buds are so nice that this is one of those ones where it just feels appropriate to pull out the jeweler's loop and take a look at what I think are going to be some rather impressive trichome fields. Oh, and I'm not disappointed. <laughs> yeah, really full. Big trichomes, big bulbous heads. Significant amount of amber, but just loads and loads. <laughs> like as I move the jeweler's loop around as far as I can see into the bud, it's just nothing but glistening trichomes. Hmm. So let me take a step back here and throw what we got back into the jar. Hmm. So there's a little note to berry, um, which I think osamine is the terpene that's giving us a lot of those berry flavors. Definitely is some berry, in, which I find unusual. I don't often detect a, a lot of berry in the weed itself when I'm smelling in the jar. Mm, but I definitely am in this one. So again, our THC is a, a bit of a guess. We're thinking it's going to be at about 20%. I'm pulling a piece of that out. I'm going to do this in the vaporizer to start, simply because I have the vaporizer right here. And, oh, sticky. Oh, wow, this is really sticky. I haven't... <laughs> I saw a picture that Seth Rogen posted on Twitter uh, with some of his new, uh, I think it was, uh, what is it, pancake ice? And he had this fairly significant nug suspended from his finger because there was so much resin on that. And I have not, I have to be honest, I haven't experienced that in a lot of bud that I have had of late. But lo and behold, look at that. I have it <laughs> suspended from my finger and there is enough resin to hold it in place. Wow. Oh, and then of course you smell your fingers after getting it in all that resin. Okay. Let me get to work. So Dunn Cannabis is under the artisan batch from a hybrid grower perspective. And as we know from a recent interview we just conducted with Leah Teal, who is the marketing director for Indiva, Artisan Batch, and hence Dunn Cannabis, is under the Indiva brand. So that makes a lot more sense now. And, and here's a little bit about Dunn Cannabis. The bar is high here, so the product is even better. Dunn Cannabis is based out of Abbotsford, B.C., and they use their own genetics to create classic and revered strains. 
It also gives them full control over the grow and output of the plants they produce. Each plant is grown in soil, flowered using high sodium bulbs, and hand-watered and trimmed to result in a premium product. Dunn Cannabis slow-dries its product in a flash of cold air at 50% humidity until the flower is up to company standards. The production team from Dunn Cannabis comes from the legacy market with decades of combined experience among them. They set the bar and the bud high. And I'd love to play on words there on high, on bud. Well, we got to have a taste of this. This is really intriguing me. It was suggested by my boss, Tarek, that this was, what was his words, the closest thing to black market weed he's seen in the, in the legitimate market. <laughs> And that may or may well be. It, it certainly is resiny and sticky. I haven't seen a whole lot of that. So uh, whatever you're doing in terms of the cure is keeping your buds pretty darn fresh and delightful, I have to say. Done. And artisan batch. So we just go out on the... Now ready to fire up the vaporizer for the first taste of this and see if I get some notes of berry from the vaporizer. And in this case, I'm actually just going to skip the joint. We'll assume, because we've also already seen some pretty quality aspects of the bud, that they would have done a, a proper job of flushing and taking care of any other nutrients that might creep into the bud upon harvest. <laughs> Another BC product. It's it's lovely to see some BC bud coming to the fore uh, after such a dismal start and <laughs> at the beginning of legalization year with all that all that bad, bad weed we had for the first year or so of legalization. And now here we are uh, into year three and get much better. And the vaporizer is up to speed. And now, actually, let me see if I can find some details on this particular bud before we dive into the details. Yeah, see, this one is so new, it's not even on their website. <laughs> Which doesn't surprise me. This is a fairly new strain that just came out. And as I say, it's not on their website yet. So I don't have a lot of further details for you on acai berry gelato. But now the vaporizer is up to speed, or up to temperature, I suppose. Now we can see how it works. Hmm? A little of those berry notes from the vaporizer. Mmm, just a nice taste. But I always love the taste of cannabis through a vaporizer. Now, what am I hoping for? I'm hoping that because these craft growers know what they were doing and they've spent the time and the effort to do that, despite the fact that the THC is still up for question, <laughs> that this is going to be a really nice indica. I'm looking for just coming to the end of my week and I'm looking for a, a real nice Friday night high where I get just kind of blasted, relax into the couch, watch whatever, and get ready for the weekend, which is probably a weekend where I'll be producing another podcast. So that's what I'm hoping for. And let's see. Starting to feel pretty nice buzz. And on the third one through, the taste is still there. I might get perhaps two more hits off of this before I have to refresh it. So that's number three. And there's a there's a bit of happy eyes starting up. Yeah. 
Yeah, there is. Not, not, not the the full switch. <laughs> Didn't raise the drapes all the way so that the happy heights are now blazing in in highness, but but feeling it, and and that's has always been for me a sign of of what is going to be a nice high, and whether or not it kind of kind of stays there or moves into more of a, a body effect. Although now that I think about it, after that last kind of hit, there was kind of a Ah, yeah. I'm going to refresh this. I'm I'm really liking what I'm feeling so far, but once more because of tolerance issues, <laughs> I am going to quickly just get enough ready for another bowl. And I guess one of the reasons why I kind of do this is, oh yeah, Jesus, that is sticky. Oh my, that is sticky. Uh, that's the, I have to say, I am pretty impressed with that. And I guess that's another reason why I wanted to get some more ready. I wanted to feel those sticky buds in my fingers. And then, of course, once you get that stickiness on your fingers, the resin just hangs around there. And it is, it, it is mellowing coming on a little bit more getting a little depth filled in behind those happy eyes still still pretty good body too ah. it's kind of end to my week that I was really hoping for and look at that see now that was pretty quick just got started, and now I'm ready to go. <laughs> mm. Yeah, I really like the taste of this. There is, and, and I guess maybe after I refreshed, I... Hit a different part of the bud, perhaps, but even more of that berry flavor. <sighs> yeah, and a nice, it's not overpowering. Like, I'm not knocked on my butt and not going to be able to move. I'm not really a fan of Coach Log, anyway, so. <laughs> I figure that's a good thing. But definitely high. And pleasantly high. A little bit of cerebral stuff, but I don't I don't really feel I'm probably not gonna edit this right after I record it because I don't quite feel like it. <laughs> so yeah, a mellow definitely an indica. Nice buzz, nice taste. Hmm, I think it's going to be a good night. So thank you, Dun Cannabis, and acai berry gelato. And this next article we're picking up from shopgoldleaf.com. Terpene flavor. It's the terpene flavor guide, which, as we all know, as listeners to the Cannabis Podcast, Terpenes are where cannabis gets its flavor, its aroma, and, many would argue, its effects. Terpenes can be found in almost all species of flora. They are chiefly responsible for the aromatic and flavored diversity in the plant kingdom. Simple chemical compounds. Terpenes are created to help plants defend themselves against threats and to attract beneficial species. In cannabis sativa, terpenes are produced in the resin glands along with the cannabinoids, and often work together to enhance or alter the effects of one another. We're going to talk about the most common and abundant terpenes found in cannabis, including their flavors and known medical benefits. Linalool. This terpene's hallmark is its floral scent, reminiscent of sharp and sweet wildflowers. It's also found in lavender, laurel, birch, and rosewood. It has calming and sedative properties and can help relieve anxiety. The medical value? Analgesic? 
anti-epileptic, antidepressant, and anti-anxiety. Beta-caryophylline. Known to have an aroma that is peppery, woody, and spicy, this is the only terpene proven to interact with the endocannabinoid system, the CB2 receptors, in our bodies. It's also found in basil, oregano, pepper, and cinnamon leaves. Medical value? Anti-inflammatory, analgesic, antispasmodic, and sleep aid. Alpha-pinene. The most common and abundant naturally occurring terpene, it is a main contributor to cannabis telltale piney aroma. It's also found in many conifer species and herbs such as sage. It's known to enhance memory and alertness. Medical value, anti-inflammatory, bronchodilator. Myrcene. Described as earthy and musky, this terpene is prevalent in most all strains of cannabis. And it is known to enhance THC uptake and contributes to the sedating and calming effects often associated with indica. Myrcene is also found in mango, hops, thyme, and citrus. Medical value, analgesic, anti-inflammatory, antibacterial, antifungal, sedative. Cumulene. Another strong contributor to the telltale earthy aromas of cannabis, this terpene is also present in hops and coriander. Cumulene can act as an appetite suppressant and offers potent anti-inflammatory abilities. Medical value, anti-inflammatory, antibacterial, analgesic. Terpineol. Due to its pleasant aroma reminiscent of lilac and flower blossoms, it is often used in cosmetic products such as soaps. It is often found in higher concentrations alongside pinene, which unfortunately may mask its scent. It is known to have relaxing effects. Medical value, antibacterial, anti-anxiety, immunostimulant. Limonene. This terpene is normally found in higher concentrations in sativa varieties and is associated with elevated mood. It can be found in the rinds of various citrus fruits, juniper, and mint. Limonene has a unique ability to quicken the absorption of other terpenes in the body. Medical value, anti-anxiety, antidepressant, gastroesophageal reflux, antifungal. Terpinaline. Having a piney aroma with notes of herbs and wildflower, this terpene is often used in perfumes and as an insect repellent. It's also found in rosemary, sage, and Monterey cypress. Terpinaline has been shown to exhibit antioxidant and anti-cancer effects and is a sedative. Medical value, sedative, anti-tumor. Geraniol. Creating a delightfully sweet smell akin to roses, this terpene is present in geraniums, lemons, and tobacco, and is often used in perfumes and other cosmetics. It's also as an effective mosquito repellent. Medical value, neuroprotective, antifungal, antitumor. Valencine. Getting its name due to its high concentration in Valencia oranges, this terpene has a citrusy, sweet aroma. It's also found in grapefruits, tangerines, and some herbs. It's common in many strains of cannabis and is shown to be a powerful tick and mosquito repellent. Medical value is still being researched. Osamine. Found in a wide variety of botanicals, it is known for its sweet and woodsy scent. Plants use osamine to defend themselves against pests in nature. It's also found in mint, parsley, pepper, basil, orchids, and kumquats. Medical value, antifungal. Bisabolol. Also carrying a distinct floral aroma, this terpene is prevalent in chamomile and likely responsible for many of its medical benefits. It can be used to heal wounds due to its antibacterial properties. Medical value, antibacterial, anti-inflammatory. Eucalyptol. Commonly associated with the eucalyptus tree, this terpene has an iconic spicy and fresh scent. It's used in a variety of products such as cough suppressants, mouthwash, and deodorants, and has many proven uses. Medical value? Analgesic, antibacterial, anti-inflammatory, sleep aid. And there you go. A recap of some of the prevalent terpenes that are in our cannabis, what some of the common smells are, and they are becoming much more common now we are always now hearing about the percentage of terpenes in cannabis. And as I've said before, back when we started the cannabis podcast, <laughs> no one even considered what the percentage of terpenes in our weed was. What a world we are living in. Just like I, when I originally started the cannabis podcast, I never thought they would come close to an hour in length. And lo and behold, <laughs> here we are. I hope you enjoyed the ride. I'm not saying that it's going to happen all the time, 
but it seemed there was enough stuff to talk about this time that here we are. If you ever have any comments about anything you hear on the Cannabis Podcast, please send a note to info at CannabisPodcast.com. Same if there's anybody you think that should be interviewed, let me know. And that wraps it up for Episode 71 of the Cannabis Podcast. From the Cannabis Infused Studio, high above the Okanagan Valley, this was the Cannabis Podcast. Thanks for listening to today's show. To check out more great cannabis podcasts, go to podconnects.com. Here's a preview of one of our other shows. Infused, a cannabis talk show, is a -a one-of-a-kind look inside the cannabis industry. Meet the amazing people who make cannabis businesses bloom as they join host Nick with Francesca and Mike for creative cannabis conversations. Get an honest look at the business of cannabis, including trends, best and worst practices, products, education, and advocacy. Whether you're kind of curious or running a cannabis, Infused has kind of conversations that count. Infused is available on YouTube and is now streaming as part of the PodConnects Network.